Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick J. Kennedy. I think you got Luke as a potential candidate for office. Isn't he good? He, he, he did it just the way I told him to just a minute ago. First of all, let me thank everyone over here for the standing ovation you just gave me when you... What strong people you are to stand throughout this whole rally and, and you're all coming out today for perhaps one of the most important causes of our time. Luke quoted my late uncle, President Kennedy, at the beginning of this rally and one of the most amazing things that John F. Kennedy did as president was to speak out on the moral issue of his time and that was civil rights. He was the first American president ever to go on national television to talk about civil rights as a moral cause. And in his speech on national television, he was the one who inserted the line, who amongst us would be willing to trade the color of their skin and be content with those who counsel patience and delay. You see, most of his advisors and most politicians back then said, we shouldn't rush civil rights. It's gonna to be too disruptive. We should take more time in guaranteeing equal rights for all Americans, irrespective of the color of their skin. And President Kennedy saw it as a basic moral issue. That age old adage to treat others as you yourself would want to be treated. And frankly, today, we haven't gotten rid of racism. We see it tragically unfold every day in those YouTubes that they're playing on the evening news about the la latest tragedy of those of African American descent and other minorities who are victims simply because of the color of their skin. And yet, because of the civil rights law that John F. Kennedy proposed that was passed in 1964 in memorial to him by Lyndon Baines Johnson and because of the Voting Rights Act after it and the Fair Housing Act and the Fair Employment Act and all those important pieces of legislation that were meant to begin to guarantee equal rights irrespective of whether someone wants to act in a racist way, the law says that it's against the law to act in that way because it's a violation of civil rights and it's a violation of their human rights. In other words, we've made progress in the last few decades because there's a new normal. And the new normal has been put in place not simply because we've changed our attitudes, but because we've changed our practices. Because to do otherwise would be against the law. And so I say that today because what we're talking about in guaranteeing equal protection for those amongst us who are suffering from an illness that just so happens to be an illness of the brain, that they are being treated in a separate and unequal fashion. They are told when they go into our healthcare system to go down the hall and drink from the colored water fountain. They're told that they're not the same patient as someone with cancer. They're told they're not the same patient as someone with diabetes. They're told they're not the same patient as someone with cardiovascular disease. 
and somehow they're made to believe that their illness is their moral failing. And you know where that attitude comes from? From the same place that racism comes from. It comes from mythology. It comes from ignorance. It comes from flat out bigotry. And we know it well enough. You know, maybe a couple of generations back, they didn't even though their common sense told them otherwise. But today we know about the brain. We've researched the brain. We understand the biological nature of these illnesses. So why do we continue to let our country, why do we let our Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, our insurance commissioners, our Blue Cross Blue Shields, Anthems United, Satanists, Aetna's all continue to treat the illness of the brain separately than they would treat any other illness of the body. How can you explain that? So I am here today to tell all of you the rally that you have started here, and this is a rally that's going to continue in different fashions as Luke said, over the coming weeks and months, is a bigger rally than just a few instances of tragedy when it comes to the cuts in this program or that program. It's a real rally about what kind of people we're going to be as a society. Because these illnesses affect every single family in the state of Arkansas. And every single family across America. And who are we kidding to think that we would relegate our loved one to the kind of conditions that they're being asked to be put into, like Paul was asked to be put into, simply because they have a mental illness as opposed to some other physical illness in their body. So, you know, I sometimes have been, have been invited and you know, introduced as someone who's the leading voice on mental health and addiction in our country, and I usually tell audiences that should tell you how bad things are in this country that I got this uh, great title. And it happened because by default, by default, because I got elected to Congress at the age of 27 as the youngest member of the House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. And I wanted to continue my co-sponsorship because that's what I thought it was going to be like I was going to sign on to this parity law but I out of 435 members of Congress I thought I'd be lucky if I made it in the top 100 and of course this bill did nothing more than say that the brain was part of the body of course it took a couple of decades for Congress to agree to that uh, idea they finally did. But I wanted to co-sponsor it. And if you can imagine, I went to Washington and I thought, uh, you know, the most popular pieces of legislation usually were reserved for those members of Congress who have been around the longest time, right? The senior people, the people with a lot of hair, a lot of gray hair or no hair at all. Right? And the fact of the matter is, my biggest surprise was when I asked around, I asked the clerk of the house, where do I find this, this parity bill? And they said, Congressman Kennedy, if you want to be the sponsor of it, it's all yours. <laughs> that should tell you what a stigma does to the state house and to the United States Capitol. It makes people silent. And I said to myself, I can't believe, as the youngest member of Congress from the smallest state in the country, 
and in the minority party, the lowest guy on the totem pole, that I would have the honor of putting my name first on a bill that guarantees equal coverage for mental illness and addiction. But that just shows you that no one else wanted to stand in front of the cameras and say they were sponsor of a bill and of course had the words in the bill, mental illness and addiction. But all you needed to do is put mental illness and no one would have showed up. But if you throw addiction on top of it, they definitely are not gonna show up. Because you know, they worried that the next question a press person would ask is, have you had a mental illness? Have you ever had an addiction? Does someone in your family suffer from those illnesses? And of course, there's no member of Congress that truly wants to answer that question. Am I right? They don't want to answer that question because they know if they say yes, there's going to be 35 more questions on, you know, how did treatment work and what medications are you on, right? And how are you doing? <laughs> to my fellows in recovery who know what I'm talking about. It's that look you get from people when they find out you're in recovery uh, that they kind of look at you sideways because of the impact of stigma. And that's why people don't raise their hand and say, I am someone with lived experience. That's why we don't have too many people who are courageous like all of you who are willing to come up to the state house and be heard. That's the reason why these decisions to cut Arkansas services for the severe and persistent, those with severe and persistent mental illness, that's why it's happening. Because no one will show their face because of the stigma of these illnesses. So you guys are courageous that you're doing this. And I want to salute all of you for uh, coming out uh, this afternoon and starting this movement. Let me just uh, conclude with some, some final thoughts. So I uh, had the honor of uh, sponsoring this bill. It took us another couple of decades. In fact, practically my whole time in office, um, you know, 16 years before we ultimately got the parity law passed in 2008. And, and it wasn't passed, I'd like to say it was passed because everybody turned out, you know, the, all of those in this country who have been affected by these illnesses came out of the woodwork and, and, and stormed Congress and convinced Congress that this was something they had to do. I wish I could say that's the reason this happened. What, what actually happened was that I called my father. You know, like whenever I needed help, I had to call my dad. And at that point in his life, he was coming to the very end of his life. He was. Uh, dying of glioblastoma, I called my father. I said, uh, Dad, I need you to do a big, big favor for me because the H.R. 1424, this bill that guarantees equal access was sitting on the desk in the Senate and it was the very end of the session. And I said, I need you to pull out all the stops and help me get this passed. And he did that. And the amazing thing about it is he did it um, and was joyful about it and was so uh, supportive of me. And the irony is, is that when I was growing up in my household, I saw him suffer tremendously from post-traumatic stress disorder, having watched his brothers both violently murdered from gunshots. I saw my mother uh, paralyzed by major depressive disorder and alcoholism and, and really uh, vilified in both in, within my family and outside my family. Um, I saw the history of my family where, in spite of the fact my family started Special Olympics, um, there was also great shame and stigma around my Aunt Rosemary for years after her lobotomy which was really a result of her psychiatric disorder. Um, and that when she was sent away, she was never seen or heard of until midway through President Kennedy's term in office, where he 
uh, had my Aunt Eunice Shriver begin to speak about the fact that his closest sibling had been born with an intellectual disability. So I know what shame is. I know what it does to a family. It silences the family. It keeps them, these issues, secret. And we say in recovery, we're only as sick as our secrets. And frankly, in our country today, we're very sick because we're keeping too many secrets about how devastating these illnesses have been on our society. The fact that we could see the greatest number of Americans in the history of this country die of these illnesses. 73,000 last year from overdose, 43,000 from suicide, that we know of. That we know of because we know many death certificates don't reveal the true cause of death. And the notion that we could have this public health epidemic and throw a fraction of the dollars towards it that we spent during HIV AIDS. We're spending less than one fifth of the dollars that we spent on HIV AIDS, spending on this national public health epidemic. And that is because of the continued challenge of stigma. So what I wanna leave you with is the notion that you are starting us on a journey of saying that's not acceptable anymore yes. and you are going to take this moment where the governor the legislature have made decisions that are going to impact people in real and very tragic ways because of these cuts and because of these decisions on who can practice treatment these are going to have very personal um, tragedies tied with them but I will it has galvanized all of you and the fight that you're taking on is not only for those and saving those from this horror but it's for changing America's attitude changing your fellows in Arkansas's attitude towards these illnesses so the, the next generation does not have to live in silence and stigma and in shame because they have a mental illness in their family, too. At the worst of the time when many people never thought they'd ever see an end to apartheid in South Africa, my uncle Robert Kennedy went there and he said to those who were gathered to try to stop apartheid, and of course it didn't happen for you know another 40 years but and it was unthinkable that it would even happen at all but robert kennedy said to those students that he was talking to or trying to get a change to apartheid he said each time a person stands up or acts to improve the lot of others they send forth a tiny ripple of hope and coming from a million centers of energy and daring, those ripples can create a current that can knock down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Yeah. And what he was saying is that it's not going to be one person who changes this. It's going to be each of us just doing our part because I can't worry about the people who just don't get it, who are ignorant, who choose to remain ignorant. I can't, I can't change those people whose hearts are full of hate instead of love, those people who's, who have been closed off. I just can only be responsible myself, each of us, ourselves, to only do what we can do. And the greatest honor and joy in my life is that when I was born, I was given this last name. I had nothing to do with it. But I'm taking all advantage of it I can. Because it means great things. 
and yeah. it's a proud legacy that I have where my aunt Eunice started the Special Olympics program that's now in 187 countries around the world and is ending the stigma of those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And this is, I think, going to be our time to begin our own movement to end that shame, isolation, and marginalization. And I would just say, it's, it's not the votes that we can bring, although we can bring votes. It's the moral challenge to this governor. It's the moral challenge that we're placing before his office today. And last time I checked, the only place in the Bible where they talk about salvation is Matthew 25. Those that are there for the least one of these, my brothers and sisters, is there for me. So Jesus was always with those who were the most outcast, most marginalized, most looked down upon members of the society. And we should know that our chance to get justice is based upon the moral suasion of this argument. And we don't need anything else but a good conscience in those legislators, in that governor, to think about what's really going on right here with these cuts. So, I just want to say uh, thank you once again for giving me the honor of being here today. Uh, this is a fight for all of us all around the country. And um, we, are, we are coming up on this 10th anniversary of the parity law. And, and it's, uh, it brings me great sorrow to say that Arkansas is not in compliance with a federal law guaranteeing equal coverage for people with mental illness. And I would put a challenge out to your Attorney General to say that part of her responsibility as Attorney General is to protect the life and well-being of her citizens here in the state of Arkansas. And I would say there's a crime that's in the process of being taking place here and she better investigate that crime. And that crime is the people in this state's lives are being put in jeopardy because of the decisions of a few who want to shut down the access to treatment for those who are simply trying to survive every day with a serious and persistent mental illness. So I, I hope the Attorney General answers this question, does she feel at all responsible when they're threatening to close two facilities with 2,500 people apiece in this state of Arkansas? Does she feel responsible for that as the legal protection for those individuals who have no other person to stand up for them but their attorney general? So I, I hope that that happens and I hope that others We'll take a, a look at this from Washington, D.C. Because you see, a lot of these states don't move until the Federal Department of Justice gets involved. And Lord knows they've had to do it before. And they've had to do it on the issue of civil rights. And they've had to do it on the issue of people with intellectual disabilities. And I'm afraid to say if the Arkansas continues to behave at the state legislative level the way they're doing today, they're going to have to do it again here in Arkansas on behalf of those with severe and persistent mental illness. 
Thank you very much. Patrick Kennedy, everyone. Patrick Kennedy. Amazing. Amazing. We've got a lot of work to do, folks.